So when you say the word chaos, different pictures come to mind. When you say the word chaos, when you, when you say a word that's that loaded, different pictures come to, come to mind. How many know we live in a chaotic time, in a chaotic culture, and we live chaotic lives? Just ask any mom that is taking their kids back and forth from soccer and softball. Hello, Bruce family. <laughs> we live in a culture that is, is becoming more and more comfortable with chaos. Now when you say chaos, different images can come in your mind. You can think of the working space of your coworker. They can look like chaos. You can think of the time when you came home to your child that was left unattended. That can look like chaos. You can think of the things that you've ignored, like your garage, that can look like chaos. <laughs> Chaos can look like that lovable, adorable, filthy animal in your house that was left by itself. Chaos. <laughs> Chaos comes in a variety of ways. A variety of pictures, a variety of expressions. But I'm convinced there is one thing that we do as believers that's more chaotic. That I, I truly believe is never the same. And if you want to experience true, genuine chaos as a Christian, go on a mission trip. If you want to experience what true unpredictability is, go on a missions trip. Go overseas. Go somewhere. That's, there we go. There's the Haiti after this. It's not a Haiti setup. I promise. I promise. If you've never been on missions before, the only plan you should have is that you plan on God doing things you haven't planned. It's just what you should have. And lives as believers, we have to understand that there is going to be chaos. We serve a God that's above all the chaos. We serve a God that hovers over those waters of chaos, and he speaks with clarity. And a couple years ago, my friend Aaron, he's here, uh, and my friend Dylan, we were in Denmark, and we were, uh, we were praying for people that were terminally ill. That was one of the main things that we went out there for with my friend Joanne, and they had these kind of healing conferences, and then we saw some pretty tremendous miracles. Well, right when we arrived there, we had planned on using Uber. But there was uh, some type of movement that shut Uber down a week before we arrived in Denmark. So we had to use these taxi services that were incredibly expensive. But again, they, they speak English in Denmark, so that wasn't the problem. The problem was trying to identify which street you were standing on. I promise, these signs were incredibly difficult to diagnosed, they looked like hieroglyphics on this screen, you know, like it was really difficult to describe where you were. So one day, we're coming out of a conference and we're tired, we've been praying all morning, and we had a small little break, so we said, we just got to get back to the hotel and take a nap when we can. So we called the taxi service, the taxi service says we're sending a car right away, we're trying to describe where we are, we see this car coming down, we wave that it's us, turns out it wasn't our taxi, it was actually somebody else's taxi, but we took it anyway, thank you Jesus. So we hop in this car, it says where to, we, we, we can't even really describe where we're going, we show the name of the hotel, he says no problem, we buckle in, and within a second he just puts his pedal to the metal and goes zero to 60. Now if you've ever been in Europe before, you have these very small roads, and people drive actually in Europe pretty reasonably, uh, not this gentleman. He just goes zero to 60, and, and we were going so fast, I grab onto the, my, my seat out in the front, and then I look at Aaron and Dylan in the back like, we are going to lose our lives right now. Well, he's heading towards this stoplight, and there's cars in front of us, and he's not slowing down. Like, please slow down, please slow down, please slow down! He said, oh! And he goes to this abrupt stop. Well, I'm about to get out of the car, because I'm not going to risk my life with this man. And as I, as I go to unbuckle, I hear the Lord say, don't leave. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Chaos of missions trips. Because there's a voice that's above every voice of practicalness. It's called the voice of the Lord. So I'm there. And I said, uh, so uh, can we drive a little safer, please? And he said, oh yeah, I'm so sorry. I just got distracted. I'm like, oh, that's not good. Second thing is not good. So he said, why are you guys here? I said, well, you know, we're, we're missionaries and we pray for those that are terminally ill. I said, oh, are you Christians? I said, yeah, we're Christians. He said, oh, I'm a Muslim. I said, oh, okay. I have many friends that are Muslims and we're there. He's like, so uh, you believe in Jesus, right? I said, yeah, we believe in Jesus. He said, I had a dream about your Jesus. I knew exactly why we were in that car. <laughs> I, said, I look back at Aaron and Dylan. Because you know, you've heard these stories, but when you're in one of those stories, you know it's this God setup. He said, I had a dream about your Jesus. I said, well, what happened in the dream? He said, it was very strange. 
There's this woman that goes to him and says, Jesus, I want to marry you. And he says, no, I have no time for marriage. I'm, going, I'm here to pray for the sick. And then a man comes and says, Jesus, let me come to your house or come to my house. And he says, I don't have time to go to your house. I'm here to pray for the sick. He says, then I was standing there. I said, what did you say? He said, I don't know. I woke up. I said, well, if you were to stand before Jesus again, what would you say? He said, I would ask him to ask his father to let me into heaven. I said, well, Jesus sent us here to let you know that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to God without him. No one goes to the Father without him. And he sent us here to say that you have access to know his power, to know his love. And rise up saying this, again, he has broken English, but you can tell it's going in. That this is as much of a God setup as you could ever dream to have. I get this impression that he has this issue with his knee. I said, for instance, you have, do you have issue, you know, pain in your knee? I said, yes. I was like, in your right knee? He said, yes. I said, I believe Jesus can heal us. We're here praying for people. We'd love to pray for your knee to be healed. He said, right now? I said, sure, it can be right now. He grabs my hand and thrusts it on his knee. I said, okay, we got really intimate real quick. And he's driving erratically. I just said, in the name of Jesus, all pain to leave. I said, test your knee out. He said, what did you do to the pain in my leg? I said, I didn't do anything to the pain in your leg. Jesus, he just, uh, Jesus, just, he, Jesus just healed you. He's like, oh my gosh, his powers are real. Oh my goodness, it's real. Well, we're there, and I'm trying to communicate the, the gospel to him, the good news of what it means. And I, I just get this impression. I say, hey, listen, God's going to send someone that speaks your native language. And he's going to tell you about Jesus in a clear way and what it means to give your life to him. And we're going to pray that that opportunity comes. Well, as we are at this stoplight and incredible traffic, praise God, I feel like the work is done so we can get out early and save our lives. So I say, hey, you know, we'll just stop off here. Well, right before we leave, Aaron taps me on the shoulder. And we've done ministry long enough to know that that means he's got a word. So he taps me on the shoulder and he says, uh, excuse me, you know, I know we prayed for your knee, but do you have pain in the right side of your neck? And he goes, who told you this? And he said, no one told me. Jesus told me. He said, well, yes, I have pain in my neck. So Aaron prays, all the pain leaves his neck immediately. He says, how did you do this? And he said, I didn't do anything. Jesus did this. And we pray right then and there that Jesus would show up in a significant way in his life. How many are grateful that we serve a God that in the midst of chaotic situations, there's one thing for sure. We're in the midst of chaos, in the midst of calamity, in the midst of confusion, Jesus can speak clearly. I'm convinced that Jesus is speaking clearly in the midst of our cultural uncertainty. Jesus is speaking not just sometimes, but all the time. The book of Hebrews is a powerful book. As you read Hebrews, again, people try to wrestle with who the true authorship is. We really don't know. When you read this book, you find this story. He's reading, you know, really writing to many that are Jews that have this past experience with Old Testament Christianity. So our Old Testament belief system in Yahweh. So as he does this, he unfolds. He opens up the whole beautiful letter and says, God has spoken in times past through his prophets and through visitations. But today he has revealed himself through his son, Jesus He's spoken in different ways, but today there's a life that speaks. Rather than past experiences, there's a present God that is speaking today. And his name is Jesus. He goes on to say that Jesus has this role in creation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He is the reflection of God's glory in the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. Jesus' word has power. Now, often when we hear the word, word, in reference to the Bible, we think of the written word of God. We think of this physical written word. But here's what we have to understand. As I've studied words, very rarely in the Bible is it referring to Scripture. It's actually really rare. Whenever they reference the word, word, or word of God, it means the active, present, speaking voice of God. That his voice is speaking. As we went into this series, I had some ideas of different things I would preach on. Really felt like God wanted us to bring clarity about some things. So I decided to study the word word. And there's 1,307 references to the word word. 
As I read through these things, I was like, how do we untangle this? And what we learned is there's several different Hebrew words and Greek words for one English word. But as you read this, the main idea is this, is that there are words that we speak, they often refer to them as sayings. But then there's the word of God that is set apart above everything else. There is this word that is speaking. So when the author of Hebrews is writing this, he's communicating that Jesus is speaking in that present Day, and he comes to this amazing verse that many of us have heard before, Hebrews 4.12. Behold, the word of God is living and active. This living word is active, and it's this idea that God speaks in so many different ways that Paul begins to say that God revealed himself even in creation so that no one is without excuse. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. That God is speaking all the time. We have to ask ourselves, are we listening to his voice? Are we listening to his voice? Are we so filled with so many things of cultural chaos that we're missing the voice of clarity that's trying to get our attention? Came across this wild quote by this poet from the 1800s. She would write, she started writing poetry at 11 years old. And there's this one phrase that just haunted me these last couple weeks. She says this, Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees and takes off his shoes witnesses. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. I'll read it again. Earth is crammed with heaven, every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. Elizabeth Barrett Browning. We have to, to wrap our minds around that God doesn't just speak on a Sunday. God doesn't just speak some of the time. He's speaking all the time. And for a lot of us, we, we kind of live these past experiences kind of like our, our hero days in high school. Where these, there's these moments where God spoke in a significant way. And we reference these things like a, a time past when we were first saved. But the Lord wants to say to you, he's not just speaking then, he's speaking now. He's speaking now and he's saying, don't miss the day of your visitation. Don't miss what I'm speaking to you now. There's a holy moment ever present that he wants to get your attention with. But are we so busy we can't hear it? See, your schedule won't create time by itself for you and the Lord. I've never had Surrey suggest to me a quiet time. <laughs> See, this is something that we have to fight for. The famous saying is nature abhors a vacuum. See, time will fill itself. It's time that we start mastering our time rather than letting it rule us. Letting our schedule rule us. But will we allow the creator of the universe to speak to us? So when we think about words, we, have, we recognize that words have power. How many of you ever had someone say something hurtful to you? But think about this. That word is just air coming through a medium. It's just from the tongue of someone through the air of, a, of this medium called air that goes to your ears. See, in reality, when you look at it physi physiologically, words don't really have substance, but we know that they have power. I can't capture a word and take it materially and put it in a bottle. But for some reason, our hearts record those things and never leave them. Our hearts hold on to those words as if they were substantive. As if they actually were a substance that we could grab a hold of. We recognize our words have power. And we have to understand where did words come from. Words come from God. And it's in the very nature and fabric of creation. So if you're going to walk with anything this morning. Know that your words have power. But secondly know that God is speaking. Because he spoke the world into existence. Why do our words have power? Because our God created everything with words. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning God. The most controversial statement you can ever read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1. 1. 
gives us implication that there was nothing and there was him only. There's this eternal being and then there's creation. And he speaks it. From his mouth, this explosion takes place. Now, I study quite a bit. And this is a question no one can answer in secular science. Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawking, Sam Harris. They can't wrestle with the reality. How did something come from nothing? No one can answer. They do their best to help divide this nuance. But they all come to this conclusion. There was something there, but we can't describe it. Sadly, at the end of his life, Stephen Hawking came to the conclusion that it was aliens from another planet. <laughs> it's not a joke. See, they, they have to wrestle with this fact that there was something that was uncreated to create everything. That's the absurdity when people say, well, then who created God? The very nature and definition of God is that which is uncreated. That's the basic understanding. It's that which is uncreated. There is something other that made everything we have. Something came from not nothing, but someone. The Bible would describe as Yahweh. So this, this being spoke things into existence. And there's this old argument they still can't answer. I think it's still one of the most bulletproof arguments. It's called, you ready for this one? The Kalam Cosmological Argument. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe has a beginning. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And this cause agent, we call God, spoken into being. And as he speaks, this unfolding happens. And he takes this planet called Earth and it's formless and void. It meant that it was uninhabitable. And he makes it inhabitable by what? Not his hands, but by his words. And as he speaks, let there be light. And there's this distinguishment between light and darkness. And here's what we have to understand. For anybody that would read this creation account that served another God, this account is absurd. When you read early creation stories of different religions, they are the most chaotic, confusing, and disturbing stories you've ever read. They're about these wars of the gods. And many would believe that just what we have was eternal. And they, we really don't understand why everything is here. And, and here's the audacity of these Jews that say, you know why everything is here? One God who's over everything, even over light and darkness. There's this one God that rules it all, and he speaks and he forms it. But then we have this unique thing happen where he crafts man with his hand, and he, and he touches creation. Think about this. All of the creation he speaks into existence, but then he forms us with his hand. And we know it's by his spirit. We know this is human language used to describe a supernatural experience. So again, he forms us with his hands. And what does he do? He breathes into us. He gives us life. It's very strange. Again, all other creation accounts would say that humanity is a nuisance to the gods. And when this would be written down, this account, again, we have to remember the Jews sustained their history through oral tradition. It wasn't the modern technology we have. There wasn't paper that could be passed around. They had these really old scrolls, and they came. They were at a great cost, and many of them would deteriorate. So when they're taken to Babylon, and they're now set free, and they're re-recording their history, they were exposed to all the Babylonian gods. They're at war with one another, and destroying one another, and trying to silence the screams of humanity. And here's a god that forms them in his image and likeness and puts his spirit in them. It's very, very strange. And from this space, place of the spirit that we have the, the divine in us, here's what we have to understand. Whenever you're speaking to someone about your faith and what you believe, eternity is written upon the hearts of everyone, it says in Ecclesiastes. There's an eternal ache in everyone that's longing to be answered. Jesus so says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and find rest for what? Your souls. Yes. The eternal aspect of you needs a soul rest that can only be found in Jesus. Because we're made in his image and likeness. The imprint and handprint of God that only he can fulfill is inside of us. 
So he gives them their spirit in Genesis 2.15. He places them in this garden to steward and to care for it. One scholar says this. I just am so dumbfounded by the goodness of God. He says this. God's first speech to humans does not center on God's place in the world, but focuses instead on the creatures and their place and role and the gifts they are given. We have this God that doesn't find you a nuisance. He finds you a gift that He wants to bless. He provides for His creation. He places boundaries in for them and says, eat everything but one thing. See, we get lost in religion when we think that God's this God of prohibition. No, He's a God of generosity and there's a whole lot of things to do, not just not a, a whole lot of don'ts. He gives us these gifts. He places them in this garden. And as they're in this garden, he gives them boundaries. But here, capture this. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. Another scholar writes, God who dominates the narrative up to this point now recedes into the background, not as the authoritarian controller of events, but as the generous delegator of power. Capture the narrative here. He speaks the world into existence. He then forms us with his hand, puts his breath inside of you, and gives us power to name things. Your words have power because God's spirit is in you. And that power is misused because of the corruption of sin. It's time that we understand our rightful place as believers, that your words have power. Your words have weight. Your words can communicate worth to someone in great need. We have to recognize that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18. The both death and life is inside of you. You have to determine how you're going to use it. So because we're made in his image and likeness, because he formed us like him and put his spirit inside of you, you now have a voice that can speak to chaos. Yeah. That's right. wow. You have a voice that can speak clarity into confusion. You have a voice that can break off shame and set captives free. Amen. Think about this. Jesus becomes the model for us to live after. And what does he do in Matthew chapter 8? He says, we're going to go to the other side of the sea. They hop into a boat. As they're in this boat, a storm comes. So he knows exactly. Terry knows exactly. A storm comes. And what's Jesus doing? He's taking a nap. He's just chilling in the back, having his quiet time. You know those quiet times. You ever been in the prayer room before? People are like, no, I'm just resting in God. No, you're sleeping. <laughs> no, you're just chilling right now. He's laying it down. And these experienced fishermen are trying to make things work. We know the seas. We know how to get things done. We know how to get where we're going. And yet the storm becomes too much for them. The storm becomes too much, and they get scared. They're so afraid they wake up Jesus. I love the way it's it's phrased. Is that they call upon him? This literally gives the echo of the Psalms, where they're waking up God. Is almost the picture of it. Like God, would you be with me? He's like I'm with you already. For a lot of us, we, we it feels like we're going through these storms, and God's not even paying attention. No, He's with you. He's just waiting for you to call upon him. He's been with you the whole time. Jesus wakes up and says, why are you afraid? And what does he do? He speaks to the storm. He speaks to the storm. What does he say after this, soon after? Speak to that mountain and it'll move. 
See, we have a God that speaks the world into existence, puts his breath inside of us, gives us power to name things. We break covenant, goes into chaos. Jesus comes back and shows us how to live again, demonstrates what it means to silence storms with your mouth in his name. And he says, in my name, you say to that mountain, move, it's got to go. You say that so that storm be silenced, it's got to stop. See that fig tree produce fruit, better produce. You're made in the image and likeness of God. This isn't a name it and claim it message. Don't get that wrong. This is a know why you're created message. You're created to see chaos calmed. A lot of us here are in the storms on our boat. We're trying to get to the other side. Jesus says, stop. Call upon me. Calm that storm. Call upon me. Calm that storm. Speak to that cancer. It's got to go. Speak to that chaos. It's got to go. Speak to that assault. It has to end. This is your rightful inheritance. For a lot of you here, this is the last thing I want to say before my friend Terry shows your testimony. Recognize your words have weight and stop using them for destruction. Recognize that your words have weight. Jeremiah chapter 1. Behold, I put my word in your mouth to tear down and to build up. What's Jeremiah tearing down? He's tearing down the false views of religion and false words of culture. There are things you need to break, but there's also things you need to declare over your friends and family for breakthrough. And your words have weight. Stop speaking death over your family, over your friends, over the chaos and culture of Instagram and Facebook. Amen. Pull out of the tide of political calamity. Come on. Stop it, church. What Christians are known for on social media? Posting about politics. I thought we served a different king. That was a different one we called allegiance to. Different one we called Lord. The politics lie. Be prophets to the people of God. Speak in a way that changes things. That gives hope to situations. Enemies throwing bait all day for us. Don't fall for the bait. Don't fall for the bait in the midst of the lions. Remember that there's a God that is with you. Like Daniel stood in that prison with lions that were hungry to devour. God was with him. God is with you. It was the silence of those storms. This morning, my friend Terry, again, as we said, messages that were not planned were spoken today. Terry had a life where she heard things spoken over her that she had to break with the truth of God. And from that place, is bringing freedom to others. Would you welcome my friend, Terry Hurd. She shares. Was I born gay? I was convinced I was. Born and raised in Southern California and Protestant, whatever that means. Jesus' birth at Christmas and prayers at holiday dinners only. June 13 of 1963, my brother Michael dies at age three. Tonsillectomy turned tragic. My dad blamed God and checked out and stayed at work. My mom got angry and my brother Todd was lost, not quite a year old, searching for his big brother. December 4th of that year, I was born with a dislocated hip. <clears throat> in my late 30s, I would get an answer in part of why I thought I could never please my mom. Why she was always angry with me. My aunt in therapy with my mom disclosed that my mom hit her stomach while pregnant 
with me, screaming at God, why didn't you take this one? I don't even know. As a young child, I was called a tomboy and my brother a fag. Just because I didn't wear girly clothes and I was better at sports than my brother at this age. On hot summer days, I ran around the neighborhood with no shirt on until one day my mom said, Terry, you need to go put a shirt on. And by the way, we need to get you a bra. Inside, I screamed, what the heck is she talking about? A bra, yuck. I didn't understand why guys got to run around and I now was trapped. My first suicidal thought came at age six, sitting on the laundry room floor, crying out to God to take me. I couldn't take this life anymore. He brought my dog, and when he licked my face, this moment passed. There would be many, many more episodes throughout my life of self-harm, always in fear of everything push-pulled. Doctors, special ed tutors, speech teachers, summer school, not understanding anything and not understood. I was always in trouble and I didn't know why. Yelling and screaming was the norm. I was called the problem child. I was bullied and then became the bully. My brother favored. Fourth grade, I heard that I, would go, I wouldn't go to school because it was my first male teacher. But this was the year I witnessed a group of girls carving their names into their arms like tattoos. Sports were my outlet. Still fearful, but I was good at it and people would cheer me on. Boys would pick me for their team first and after the game was over, so was I. Passed over and never asked to dance. High school using drug, alcohol drugs got me accepted into the big guys on campus and those already out of school. My friends' families were more of a family to me, so I was never at home. First time I ever witnessed a mother reading her Bible and TBN on the TV. I always wanted to be over there, and my mom tried to stop me one day. She said, what is it? Are you guys lesbians? This would be the first time I put my hands on my mother and I slammed her against the wall. There would be many other demonic explosions throughout my life. I hated her and I loved her. They gave me a diploma, already told only money for my brother for college. And I never told about the volleyball scholarship offer from Long Beach State. There was no way I could cheat my way through college. And I thought I wasn't good enough anyways. That Thanksgiving dinner table, I was pressured by my family, what are you gonna do with your life? Be a beach bum? So I did only what I knew how to do. I went to Laguna Beach, took way too much acid, and God interrupted my buzz and told me to go into the army and don't tell anyone. I was so scared. I took the test, I lost five pounds, and I was going to be a truck driver. Nobody wanted me to go in except my mother. 1983 basic training fort in Dix, New Jersey, there was a group of girls off to the side and I wanted to be a part of their group. They shut me out because I would speak of hating homosexuals and spraying them with fire hydrants at the bus stops. One of these girls took me under her wing and I had my first experience with her. But wait, my family and my friends would disown me. Off to Germany, heartbroken and rejected from this girl but not being a hater of gays anymore, compassion. I met my husband, yes, I was married. <laughs> I met my husband, and when we finished our military duty, we moved to my hometown. Cocaine came into the picture. My closest friends told me they, they were all gay, and I told them about my experience. I started going to the gay bars with them and prayed out loud, God, I would only leave my husband if he would cheat on me. My husband had no characteristics of unfaithfulness, but it happened. Later, the Lord would disclose to me that cocaine, meth, and heroin were literally the devil's potion. I started to use meth to lose weight, and now I was convinced I was gay and lived that lifestyle. 1989, miraculously, I passed the test in academy and became a youth correctional officer. Such a hypocrite with everything. Do as I say, not as I do. 
A co-worker gave me a Bible and turned me on to Joyce Meyer. I never read the Bible, just kept it in my vehicle. I do remember when the subject of homosexuality came up, I said, well, man wrote that, not God. So blind and so deaf. I always felt so much pain around me and through me that I would use more and more meth to harden my heart. People wanted me at their parties, but behind closed doors I was hitting walls, abusing loved ones, and killing myself, spiritually dead. 2003, I medically retired, I had a nervous breakdown, and moved to Sacramento to get away from meth, but I just found it here. Hospitals, psychiatrists, psychologists, diagnosed bipolar, a little schizo, my mom always yelling and screaming, personality disorder, manic, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, and last but not least, suicidal. The house I rented became a crack den, and I was a shot caller, demonic to say the least. All the pharmaceutical medications I was on were all weight gainers, and one Christmas morning, I found myself at my end, in the emergency room, 400 pounds, I couldn't breathe, and my shins were splitting down the middle and pouring out water. I cried out to God, if you are real, show me a sign. 2012, August 19th, I walked into Warehouse Christian Ministries in Sacramento to hear some music. The pastor said, we are having an open baptism at the park later, and even if you were baptized as an infant and you, re re and you respect Jesus, come and get baptized. I had so much fear in me. But I went, and supernaturally, things started happening. Sexual encounters stopped, and I was comfortable sleeping on the couch. But, but I was still gay, right? My partner and I became domestic partners for legal purposes for rights in hospitals. And when the law said we could get married, I began making plans. I started hearing this voice inside me. Ask the doctors about medical marijuana. The doctor said I was a good candidate and I was off all pharmaceutical medications and using only alternative meds. At a Joyce Myers conference in Sacramento I went to, I asked out loud, Jesus, if you are real, show me a sign. He showed me two. I said hi to this lady in a nice shirt. She was wearing a Joyce Myers t-shirt. She said nothing and left. Feeling embarrassed, I thought, oh, she must not have heard me. She came back and bought me a shirt, and it fit. And when they played this season on TV, out of all those people, there I was, and Joyce talking about covering up scars. April 2014, the Sunrise Mall had an event called The 99. Live actors playing ultimate near-death experiences, hell and Jesus at the cross. My partner and I said yes to prayer at the end. I had asked, and I said, I'm looking for more Thumper Church. I didn't even know what that meant or what even home church was. It just came out of my mouth. She told me about the Rock of Roseville. I live in Rancho Cordova, and the Lord took me to a church close to me, to be, me there, but it was clear. He said, I just want to show you something, but this is not your home. I went to the rock, and someone helped me fill out the, the newcomer's card. When it came to marital status, I said, sorry, I have a domestic partner. I don't even know why I was apologizing, but she said, that's okay, welcome. I was so scared, but the Lord told me to go to the front row and sit. I went to the middle of the front row, and a man came up to me and hugged me. It was Pastor Francis. I was not a hugger. <laughs> <laughs> and, and was like, who is, who is this guy? The Lord spoke to me that day and said, this is your home. <coughs> Shortly after that, I was in, in my mobile home, and the heavens opened up, and an audible voice said, my word is true. I hit the deck and fell on my face. I was shaking, but I felt so much love. I lifted my head and said, but Lord, how am I to read the Bible? You know I cheated my way through high school, that's how I tell you. 
Then the soft voice came from my heart and said, that's why I brought you the Holy Spirit. He is going to teach you. The Holy Spirit started teaching me about tithings and giving, that it was about trusting God with everything. Pawn shops no more, praise God. Church altar call. If you have something you want to get rid of, come, give it to the Lord. I knelt down and said, Lord, take meth from me. I was supernaturally healed, 25 years of addiction gone, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Thirst and hunger kept me going. Reading the word was amazing. God was speaking to me. I read marriage between a man and a woman. Told my partner we can't get married. No problem. She never thought she was gay anyways. <laughs> that was a plus, right? <laughs> but I thought I was still born that way. Then it happened. I was getting free food at this Catholic church, and a Christian African American older gentleman said to me, abomination. I didn't even know what we were talking about, but I will never forget the look on his face. Did that just come out of my mouth? <laughs> my stomach hurt. My stomach hurt so my stomach hurt. And I looked up this word on my roommate's phone when I got home. Homosexuality, an abomination to God. I hit the floor crying. God, how can this be? I thought I was born this way. I then saw a real to real vision of my life and choices I had made. I renounced and repented and have never struggled in this area again. <laughs> I received confirmation that the Lord gives real to real visions. It was a healing night and a, and a Muslim lady shared her testimony about an encounter with Jesus, a real to real vision of her life, and she gave herself her life to Jesus. I chose to go deeper and deeper, every prayer group, every conference, to Dr. Moss training, renouncing, repenting, and inner healing sessions. After fasting and praying 12 days, the Lord freed me from all medications. Five years, no alcohol, no cigarettes, no drugs, no meds, no sex on purpose, and no struggles in these areas. I am a beloved daughter, uniquely and wonderfully made. I am the bride of Christ, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I am just a normal Christian, a child of God, just like you. I love you.